The Lord be with you. Thank you. It's time for us to begin and we open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your word, a word that comes to life in Jesus Christ, the living word, a word which brings us our salvation, a word which blesses us with comfort and peace and joy, a word that shares your will for our lives and our eternal life to come in heaven. We ask you to bless this time, Lord, that our hearts may be open to your word and blessed by your word this day in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, um, beginning with Paul brings Christian baptism to Ephesus. So while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Ephesus. Remember before, on his second missionary journey, he had stopped at Ephesus, but then he um, couldn't stay on because he was heading to Jerusalem and he needed to get going. So um, he said, if it's God's will, I'll be back. And he is back. Now he's back. And by the way, um, you did get the handout also with a map of the third missionary journey on there. So this is, we've already, we've left Antioch and we're up along the way and we just, hit, we crossed up what we, present day Turkey and all the way over to Ephesus on the coast is where Paul is now. Um, Ephesus was the capital of the province of Asia, um, Roman province, um, home to a tourist attraction, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis, was a huge temple. If you've ever seen in, in one of the famous temples of the ancient antiquity is the Parthenon in Athens. That's a big temple, it's nothing much there except a few columns, you know, but still, the Temple of Artemis was three times as big. It was huge. It was a huge, huge temple. And um, uh, in, in it was a statue of Artemis. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and it, this was a, it was a, the whole thing around the, the Artemis, uh, it was all this superstitious type stuff. Um, it was like the magic capital of the ancient world. Um, that's, if, uh, um, Ephesus was famous for magicians and for spells and, and charms and all this superstitious kind of stuff. And you can see it in the chapter as you hear about these guys going out ex exercising demons and that kind of stuff. But anyway, so he's at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, <coughs> excuse me, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So in a way, maybe he's asking them, did they receive any special gifts of the Spirit? You know, when you, every, every single Christian, every believer is gifted by the Holy Spirit. And you can't be a believer without the Holy Spirit. And also, um, the, the Spirit gives gifts to all Christians. We all have gifts. We have different abilities, different gifts that God gives. <coughs> Excuse me. So he asks, do you have any special, do you have the, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they answered, no, we've never even heard there is a Holy Spirit. It's like, whoa. Um, so Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? And they said, John's baptism. Um, so not a Christian baptism. You know, John's baptism was looking forward to what was to come. And the Christian baptism is based on what Jesus came and did do, his death and resurrection. So John's baptism is pre, pre uh, the payment of our sins on the cross, pre the resurrection from the dead. So John's baptism is not Christian baptism. Um, also, you know, John's baptism was basically a threat, you know, repent or you're, you know, you brood of vipers, repent or you'll be destroyed. Okay. So that was a threat. Whereas the gospel is believe and be saved, you know, believe and be saved. And we still need to repent of our sin, but it's a different message in the sense of it's, it's, it's a message of grace and good news, not a message of condemnation and calling to repentance in that sense. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, you know, versus a baptism of forgiveness in Christ that we have in Christ. Um, and an application would be, as believers, it's one thing to know the condemnation and the moral duty of being better. You know, we're all called to live a better life. We're called to be, you know, good and to do the right thing. Of course, we fail in our sin, but we're called to do that. But such knowledge is incomplete without the grace of Christ and the help of the Holy Spirit. And that's what those guys didn't have. They knew they were called to live a good life or live a, you know, a moral life, 
to you know, be a repentant kind of life, but they didn't know the grace of Christ, and they didn't know the help of the Holy Spirit. So Paul told the people to believe in the, the one coming after him, or John, sorry, John told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. So this is kind of like Apollos. Remember Apollos? He knew about Jesus, and he knew about John, you know, John's message, but he didn't know the full message. And that's, these guys are kind of like Apollos. They don't know the full message, and so then Paul sets them straight. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. So here we have faith in Christ, you have baptism, you have the Holy Spirit, they go together. You can't just have like, oh, you got baptism over here, you know, and then Christ is over here, and the Holy Spirit's over here. No, they go together. They go together. And, and that's what happened here. They, they just had baptism, and it wasn't even Christian baptism. It was just baptism of John. But now Paul brings them Christ, and then the Holy Spirit comes with that baptism. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Uh, there were about 12 men in all. So this is kind of reminiscent of the day of Pentecost. Isn't that what happened to the apostles on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit came in a special way, in special gifts, what are called sometimes sign gifts versus serving gifts. You know, serving gifts are gifts that you use for the benefit of others, you know, for, for uh, teaching others or for hospitality or for um, uh, maybe singing gifts and all other kind of gifts that you serve with, whereas sign gifts are like um, gift of miracles, gift of, of speaking other languages this is what they did on Pentecost. And here it says tongues, but it could be translated other languages because that's basically the words, speaking languages as they did on Pentecost. They spake, spoke all those languages and people could understand them with different, in different cultures or different languages. Um, so, so it's like a little mini Pentecost there for those guys. So we continue on in verses 8 and following. Paul's ministry and its impact over the course of two years. So in just a short time, Luke covers a couple of years. And this is a long time. Paul doesn't normally, he never stayed that long in a place, you know, not, not usually. He stayed in Corinth quite a while on his second journey. But here he really stays and, and, and stays there a long time. So verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. The the. the Um, they publicly maligned the way. And that's the name for the, 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 the Christian movement. You know, it was called the way after Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So um, Paul left them uh, at that point, which is a familiar story. That's happened before. When, when it gets to the point where they're just obstinately rejecting the gospel, he says, okay, so be it. You know, shake the dust off my, my garments, you know. Uh, time to move on. And so he does. He leaves them. And he took the disciples with him, the believers he takes with them, and then had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So kind of like having Bible study time um, in this lecture hall there in Ephesus. Um, and apparently, one Greek manuscript notes, it was between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m., which is the, the heat of the day, which makes sense because that's when it would be available because no one is using it. During, it's kind of like the siesta time in certain cultures where everything shuts down during the heat of the day. You know, you work in the morning, you work in the evening, but in the middle of the day when it's super hot and just all, you, know, you can't function, you don't do work, you just kind of take it easy and try to stay in the shade, that kind of thing. And so that's when it would be available. Um, not the, the, Tyrannus would give his lectures in the morning or in the evening, but here's a, a, for a cheap rate, you can have my lecture hall, you know, at this time of day when it's like, no, we're not using it. And so they used it, and they, this went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So it was a, somehow it was, a, it was just a great setup for Paul, and it just, he just kept, kept going and going and teaching and teaching and teaching, and, and people, more and more people came and believed, and it grew and it grew and it grew. Verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles. Now, I, want to, I, I note at that moment, not an insignificant choice of words. What do I mean by that? 
God did extraordinary miracles. God did them. This is not Paul and his power. It's God's power. Because that's when the next words are through Paul. You know, it wasn't done by Paul. I mean, technically you could say it, yes. But it's really God's working through Paul. It's God's doing these miracles. God is uh, blessing people. God is healing people. Not Paul himself. God did the miracles. And so that even handkerchiefs and aprons, aprons would be like a work apron, you know, that a craftsman would wear, that kind of thing, that had touched him were taken by the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. So all this miraculous stuff, those, those would be sign gifts, you know, the Holy Spirit working through uh, those, those signs, signs and wonders. Um, again, it's not by, by the handkerchiefs. The handkerchief has no power. The apron has no power. But God uses through them, he brings healing. And you could think of that in a sense uh, as we talk about the sacraments. You know, it's not just water. It's not just bread and wine. Like bread and wine is going to forgive you, but it's God works through the bread and wine, in, with, and under, as Luther puts it. You know, he comes to you in this bread and wine and brings you forgiveness, Christ's forgiveness. Same thing in baptism. It's, it's, it's water doesn't, doesn't heal you or make you a child of God, but it's the water connected with God's word. Then through that, God works. And in a way, this is stretching now, but in a way... Through our words and deeds, we can be living sacraments. Okay? A sacrament is a holy thing. You know, sacra means sacred. A sacrament is a holy thing. And we have a specific definition of it. I won't go into it right now. But, but in a sense, when we're children of God, you know what? God says you're holy. Not because you're perfect, but holy is set apart. You know, you've been set apart by God. You don't belong to the world. You belong to Christ. And so as a, as a holy one of God, as a saint, you can be a living sacrament. And through you, God works as we bring the gospel to others. So in a way, we're, we're, we have a sacramental life, you know, living uh, through us. God then can work uh, through our word and deed. Okay, chapter 19, verses 13 and following. The name of Jesus gains respect and delivers a blow on superstition. So um, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. So these, weren't, these aren't believers. These are just some Jewish people, guys, who were itinerant exorcists. In other words, they go around, they travel around, and their job was to, quote, cast out demons. Whether they actually ever really did anything like that or su succeeded, who knows. But it was kind of that whole... Uh, that suspicious type of worldview, um, magical-based, um, very common in, in the ancient world, that kind of a thing. But anyways, they would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. So they, they'd seen Paul at work, and they thought, wow, this guy's got this name, this powerful name, Jesus, and he uses it like it's a magic incantation, and now we can, we'll use it. So they tried that. Uh, seven sons of Sceva, a Jew Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them. I just love this. It's just, it's a, it's just amazing, this whole dialogue here, or this, what, what the evil spirit says. He says, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Who are you to be using that name, you know? And it's like, because they had no power over this evil spirit. They didn't. And so, you know, and without Christ, without Christ, they had no power over the evil spirit, none. And, and for us too, you know, without Christ, we're, we're helpless. Uh, James 2 says, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So the, the, in this case, the demon knows who Jesus is. The demon knows who Paul is. But these guys, they're nobodies. And so then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran, out, ran, that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Man, it's like, whoa! I wonder if they ever. If any of you have watched uh, the Chosen, the TV series Chosen, the Chosen, it's really good. You know, it's just a, a modern retelling of of the story of the Gospels, and you know, it's 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 just it's really good. I, I encourage you to watch it if you have a chance. It's, I think it's on season three. 
four. I, I wonder if they'll ever do the book of Acts. That would be cool too. After they do chosen, then they could do, then they could follow that. I'd like to see this scene done, you know. Well, not, not because they run away naked, not that part. Just, <laughs> just the part about these guys who are so running around using Jesus' name as if, you know, they have this power and then the demon confronting them and then beating the snot out of them. It's just like, my goodness. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Verse 17, then when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. So in spite of the charlatans and all that kind of stuff, God is at work, and God is able to, um, his, Jesus' name is exalted. <clears throat> Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. And the Greek there, the, the evil deeds, the Greek for that can also be translated as magic, in a sense of evil spells, magic spells. You know, the evil spells that they had, had been doing. Um, and a number, and that's what makes sense about the next verse, a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together, all their magical scrolls and stuff, and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas, okay? That's a, first of all, it's a, a complete break. Like they're saying, we're done with sorcery. We're not going to even hang on, oh, we got these nice sorcery scrolls. They're also pretty and expensive. No, the temptation would be to go back and take a look at them. And they say, no, we're done. We're burning them all. We're getting rid of them. Just, just you know, going to be done. Cold turkey. <clears throat> but it's also a very expensive uh, thing. 50,000 drachmas. If you, back in that, in that day's wages, if you were to work to earn that much money, you had to work 160 years. I did the math and figured it out. 160 years you'd have to work. That's working a six day work week, which they did back then. But you had, you'd have to work for, for 160 years to earn enough money if you put every penny you earned toward these squirrels, what they're worth. So that's, that's a lot. That was a pretty expensive thing that they gave up on behalf of the Lord. Uh, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Uh, an application here is God calls us to not get cozy with our sins. You know, it's kind of like sometimes we, like our scrolls of the, you know, the things in our lives, we, we want to kind of hang on to those things. Um, but he calls us to not get cozy with our sins and to continue in them, but to break from them regardless of the cost. Regardless of the cost. Uh, Romans 6 tells us, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Now, Paul isn't saying, he's not teaching Christian perfectionism when he says that. He's not saying you can now go out and live without sin. But it's, he's talking about when we live in sin. Like when Jesus told the woman who was uh, caught in adultery and said, he said, go and sin no more, right? In the King James, is that going to be possible for her to never sin? And he, again, no. What it actually he's saying is leave your life of sin, no more prostitution, no more adultery. You know, there are things like that you leave behind. You're a Christian, you know, you're a believer. Those things, they go, they go. You don't live in that sin. Oh, I'll just keep living in sin because God will keep forgiving me. Great, no, no, we leave that life of sin. And, and then he, these guys, they did that. They, they said, sorcery, gotta go. Burn it, it's gone. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. Um, he's going to visit the people there that he's met before um, and also to gather donations for Jerusalem. So Macedonia and Achaia, that's that, well, you got it on the map there. That yeah, shows you right on the map. <clears throat> Present day Greece area where he had been before, Philippi and Thessalonica and Corinth and all those great places. Um, and then after I've been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. So he intends to go, go visit the, the believers, strengthen the churches in the missions there, and then go back to Jerusalem and take the offering to the poor in Jerusalem who were having a hard time. Um, and then he was going to, um, uh, he intended to go to Rome. He wanted to go to Rome, which is going to happen. Not in the way he thought, but it's going to happen. Uh, he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. Um, first Corinthians tells us, um, when Paul, Paul wrote to the Corinthians from Ephesus and he said, I will stay on at Ephesus because a great door for effective work has opened to me. So 
the, the Spirit was working so greatly in Paul there, he just, he just wanted to stay even longer and just stayed and stayed and stayed for a total of almost about three years. And then the chapter ends with, um, with uh, Luke telling us kind of one of the highlights or one of the big things that happened while Paul was in Ephesus, and that's the riot in Ephesus. Verse 23, about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way, again about Christianity. A silversmith named Demetrius, who, had three, had, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen, it's like, you know, um, it's just, it's, I don't know how to put it. I love Luke's writing, the way he does this and he explains it. It's just, it's so, I don't know, just, just good. <laughs> it's brought in no little business for the craftsmen, you know. In other words, they're making a, a pretty penny selling souvenirs for tourists. That's what it was. People would flock to Ephesus to see the Temple of Artemis, and they make these little silver shrines, you know, that people can buy. You know, and take with them and display and, you know, put it on their, instead of a bobblehead on their chariot, <clears throat> they could put a shrine of Artemis on it. So um, <clears throat> he called them together, Demetrius called the tradesmen together, the craftsmen, along with the workmen in related trades and said, man, you know, we receive a good income from this business. Okay, money is at stake. And so this is going to be pretty big, pretty important. And you, you see it here how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is a danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited <clears throat> and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. So do you think he's really... Concerned, concerned with theology. <clears throat> this is all about money, about the wallet. And it's like Paul's preaching cuts into our money making. Because if, if people stop buying the shrines and going to the, the idol and to the temple and all this stuff that, and not buying our goods, you know, we're going to be out money. That's what they care about. They don't care about Artemis. You know, Artemis is just a god. But, but they care about their money. Now, the temple of Artemis, Artemis was a fertility god, a goddess, and, um, uh, and that temple had, was famous for its temple prostitutes. Um, in the evening, they would come out from the temple, and the priestesses of the temple, they were uh, just prostitutes, basically. Um, <clears throat> when they heard this, um, the crowd, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Ar Arist Aristoc Aristarchus, <sighs> Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man th into the theater. So there's a big giant theater. I read somewhere it could seat up to 26,000 people. It's an amphitheater, you know, outdoor on a hillside. It's a pretty big theater. So they rushed into there, and uh, this big mob, and... Um, uh, they grabbed the two, two of Paul's companions. One of them, Aristarchus, by the way, later on is shipwrecked with Paul. When Paul is on his journey to Rome, Aristarchus is with him. Uh, we boarded a ship about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. So there's Aristarchus. Um, and they end up getting shipwrecked along the way, and Aristarchus is with him. Uh, later on in Colossians, you read about Aristarchus supports Paul when uh, Paul's in prison. He says, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Or as he writes to uh, Philemon, uh, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So Aristarchus is somebody who is mentioned in a number of places and is a companion of Paul, a Greek convert. You know, Gentile, convert, not a Jew. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. So his fellow, you know, the, the believers said, no, you can't go with the crowd. They're, they're upset at you. You know, you're the target of their anger. You can't go in there. And even some of the officials of the province, okay, they were called Asiarchs, like Asia Arcs, <laughs> like the Asiarchs. Um, these, are, these would be um, like upper-level upper, upper level, uh 
bureaucrats, you could say, or power people. Um, not necessarily believers, but the text says they were friends of Paul. Somehow he had befriended them. They were reasonable people. Um, you know, they weren't a bunch of lunatics. And they sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater as well. So they're, they're looking out for Paul. Um, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know what, why they were there. Isn't that typical? Of a, I, not, I, I don't know. Somewhere along the way, I was taught, if you see a crowd, stay away. <laughs> you know, crowds do crazy things and, and sometimes go, go crazy ways. And you got to be careful with crowds. But that hit the nail. I like the way Luke says that. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front. Okay, so Alexander was a leader of the Jews, not a Christian, not a believer, not a follower. But, and he probably wanted to go, they wanted him to go, you go explain that this is not us, you know, we Jews. They didn't want to have an anti-Jewish riot. And so, go tell them it's Paul. It's that Paul and his Christian Jesus stuff. They're the problem, not us, not us. And, um, and so they, they shoved forward Alexander, um, who's a leader of the Jews, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they, they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. So they shout down Alexander so he doesn't get a word in. So they're out there shouting and chanting and shouting and shouting for two hours. Sounds like a fun time, right? <laughs> Finally, the city clerk quieted the, the crowd. Uh, and he has a self-interest at stake here because he, he's a Greek. He's not a Roman official. He's a Greek official. This is a Roman province run by a Roman uh, proconsul. But, um, but he has, he's kind of like the go-between between the Greek city. It's a Greek city, Ephesus, Greek, although it's controlled by the Romans. Just like Jerusalem is a Jewish city controlled by the Romans. You know, it's part of the Roman Empire. And this is a Greek city, and he's a Greek official. And he's the go-between between between the Romans and the Greeks, so to speak. And he knows if trouble happens, he might be in trouble himself with the Romans. He doesn't want to be in trouble with the Romans. So he quiets down the crowd and says, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and and of her image, which fell from heaven? Apparently, the, the statue that was carved was made from a meteorite. You know, some stone that fell from heaven. And then it's like, it must be a god came from the sky and then they carved into it some fertility symbols and stuff and and so um, anyways that's at the center in this big temple um, so he's saying like hey come on we all know Artemis is great you know you don't have to stand here for two hours chant it you know we're well known for that therefore since these facts are undeniable you ought to be quiet and not do anything rash you have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are pro councils. They can press charges. So in other words, you can just follow the law. None of this chaos. And all this. Um, if there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. And that's what the Romans like to hear that. You know, they'd like to hear that. That's what Roman law is meant to do. As it is, we are in danger. We are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there's no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. It's like, and you can imagine after standing out there for two hours in the hot sun, shouting your, your voices, like, I'm going to go home and drink some water and lay down, you know. And they, they were probably happy to disperse at that point. And so, and, but once again, Roman rule guards Christianity, allows it to continue. Just like in the, back in previous, remember the, the thing in Corinth, and, and, and the, the Roman governor said, hey, this is a squabble, this is a religious squabble, you know. You, you, you can't do, you know, I'm not going to do anything against it. So here again, the Roman, he says, we need to have legal assembly, you know, do this the right way. And, and they all just gave up and went home. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
you're on.